Jane, Brooklyn, New York. A new day has arrived in cable TV. Strap yourselves in for a fun ride. It's the Cyclone Variety Show. Now here's your host, Cyclone! Y'all miss me much? I know you didn't. Y'all are liars. Bad liars. Bad, bad liars. Oh, stop. I know y'all hate me. Boy, oh boy. It is so good to be back. Uh, any sports fans in the house? Have you heard the brilliant move the New York Mets have pulled off? You know, since they kind of, well, suck this year, they decided they needed some extra money. So what they're doing is they're opening up City Field this November to play golf. Yes, while the Mets are actually playing golf on a real golf course, you, for the low, low price of $900, can go play golf at City Field. I guess what's going to be next on the pitches mound? Maybe like, I don't know, a volleyball tournament or something? Uh, Dunkin' Donuts has started a new uh, giveaway, if you c- want to call it that, with the New York football teams. Well, let's call it what they are. The New Jersey football teams. Apparently, if the New York Jets win a football game this year, you could go to Dunkin' Donuts and you get 25 cents off of a coffee. If the New York Giants actually win a game this year, you get to own your own Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, anybody watch the Emmys this past weekend? Apparently the Emmys suddenly became the Rachel, Rachel Maddow show. Guess that's for the very high-level intellectuals. Oh, wait. Actually, you know, uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus winning for the sixth time and Veep winning... Oh, an Emmy kind of proves one thing. The Emmys are more fixed than Canelo Triple G. Uh, I do have some bad news for all of you here today and for those of you watching at home or wherever you're watching. I don't know because I'm not with you right now. The world is coming to an end Saturday. Yep. According to one of the Bible passages... The world comes to an end this Saturday. Yes, I finally get what I want. To die. Guess that means we're going to have to do some fast edits then this weekend, huh? Just a little inside joke. Uh, Owners of the uh, Galaxy S8 were told that they can now disable... The Bixby button on their phones. And Bill said, don't you dare, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Uh, what else is going on? Leonardo DiCaprio has said he wants to play Stan Lee in the upcoming biopic of Stan. Sure. Don't let nobody else get a a slice in there, Mr. DiCaprio. Hmm? What's the matter? A fat white Jew can't play Stan Lee? But, uh, you guys ready to start off a really, really good show? Yeah. 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 All right, well, you know what? I got some really great guests. All the way from the nutmeg state, this guy is an absolute film genius. I can call you a genius, right? Mr. Phil Hall is here. Comedian Jeffrey Paul, the world traveler, has traveled to Brook Island to be here to make you guys laugh. And starting it all off, ladies and gentlemen, this guy is a true talent. If you look in the dictionary under talent, you see his picture. Because it's true. Ladies and gentlemen, Grant Stanett.
never stand a chance You would never know pain Of what you're going through right now As I go back and change it all If I'd only known Watch the others die, watch the others cry, watch the others fade away was your wife and what if the other saved your life and what if the others were good men too as well as the bad Stand a chance You will never know pain Of what you're going through right now As I go back and change it all If I'd only known Was I right or was I right? Of course, I'm always right. Get that crew? I'm always right. So, like I said, joining me, film critic, film genius, all the way from the Nutmeg State, Mr. Phil Hall. Phil. Thank you. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Nutmeg State being Connecticut. For those out there that don't know our oh, nickname. That's true. There's a lot of people that don't know. A lot out there. It happens. So, let me ask you a question. When you decided to branch out on your own from other organizations, yes. what made you decide to, A, title it an online movie show, and to use that as the genre of your show. Well, I have to explain to the audience, uh, I have a podcast on SoundCloud called The Online Movie Show with Phil Hall. And you can find it online at soundcloud.com slash online movie show. Uh, I had been working with a, another podcasting group out of Connecticut for about two years uh, and decided to go out on my own because of, uh, I felt that I could do a better job on my own. Called it The Online Movie Show because as a podcast, it is online. And it is a show about cinema, uh, classic movies, as well as contemporary independent films. Now, you just started season two yes. last week. Yes. Who would you say, out of all your guests so far, has been the A1 guest? Oh, I hate to play favorites because I've had so many wonderful people on. I just had uh, Karen Allen, iconic actress from Raiders of the Lost Ark. She was the guest on the first episode of the second season. But I've had uh, film scholars like uh, Jim Nyber and Paul Scrabo on. I've had uh, people like John O'Dowd. Uh, I have Gary McKee coming up. They've written wonderful biographies of uh, notable people. Lon Davis is a silent film uh, historian. I've had independent filmmakers uh, who are currently active, like Christian DeRizendis uh, was on the show, and Daniel Blake Smith. I, I don't want, it's like asking a parent who's your favorite child, and it's... Uh, to me, it, it would be, we've had 36 episodes on already, so I'd say it'd be about a 36-way tie. 
Very good. Now, here's a million-dollar question for okay. you. And it's good that you just mentioned, you know, silent films. Why do you think th there's no more true classics like there were back in the day? Because filmmakers have gotten lazy. Uh, we have, there's an over-reliance on CGI. There, for the big special effects films, there's an over-reliance on vulgarity for the comedies. There's a sense of puerility for the romantic films. So uh, what is there out there? I, maybe I sound like a bit of a snob, and I hope the your viewers don't turn off the TV when I'm spouting this out, but uh, to me, it's just, it becomes very tiresome watching a lot of today's films because I don't get anything out of them from an intellectual level, I don't get anything out of them from an emotional level, and I don't get anything out of them from pure entertainment level. I agree with you wholeheartedly, except for being such a Batman freak, I just have to continue... Mm -hmm. If it's a comic book movie, I, I make the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. So, if you had to choose another Sophie's Choice, do you have a favorite actor actress? Do I have a favorite uh, contemporary or classic? Classic. Cl oh, classic. I mean, I love Humphrey Bogart and John Wayne. Could watch those films over and over. Uh, actress, going back old school, uh, Betty Davis, Catherine Hepburn. Elizabeth Taylor, even Elizabeth Taylor's wackier films too. Uh, she's she's never done anything that's boring. Now, like we said, you just started your second season. Yes. Long range, do you think three, four, five season? Do you? That would be fun. You? I don't see why not. As long as I can get guests on the show, uh, because in doing the podcast, I'm not just the host. I'm also the producer, and I'm also the. Uh, the fellow who's booking the guests, and I, actually I'm in the process now of putting together uh, more guests into the second season. We've already uh, recorded 10 episodes, and we're going to go about 35 episodes per season, so I already have uh, 10 down for the second season. I'm going to go for another 8 or 10, and uh, at the end of the year we'll record another 8 or 10 more and keep going until I hit about 35. And as someone who books not just this show, but my own podcast as well i know how hard it is to get and to keep guests so i give you much much credit for, for pushing through that brick wall of, of fighting that 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 want to strangle guests at times mm -hmm. well there's a secret to it actually the thing is don't leave anything for the last minute uh when i'm booking obviously i'm recording the shows in advance so I'm able to book the guests uh, at least a month in advance and have it lined up on their calendar and then follow up with them just to make sure that they are still confirmed with that. Uh, I'm also a very persistent person. Uh, you, I'm a journalist by training and I'm, my job requires me to go chasing after people, getting quotes and getting my story done on deadline. So I was able to transfer that skill into the production of the podcast. You know, in a backward sort of way you've just given me the secret key to success really i i gotta admit i think so mm -hmm. so you tape out of platinum wolf studios yes platinum wolf studios is a uh, recording studio it's out in conkama new york how did you find it coming from connecticut craigslist really <laughs> yeah believe, was... believe it or not you can find serious businesses on craigslist I was uh, looking in Connecticut, and I couldn't find a studio that I felt was satisfactory. So I just did a, a search on Craigslist through uh, the New York. I wanted something that I'd be, be able to drive to. It's only a 90-minute drive from my home. And I spoke with Glenn Wolf, who runs the studio, and uh, we hit it off and seemed like a good place. And we went out, t uh, recorded a few test episodes just to make sure it was fine. Everything was perfect, and I've been working with him, uh, as I said, so second season. Has it reached a point where you have to start? Because I know in the past you've done it with other shows you've been associated with, dealing with sponsors. No, my show isn't sponsored. Uh, I'm sort of fortunate that I'm just uh, able to self-fund it because I don't want to go through the hassle of having to get sponsors and have contracts and all of that rigmarole. So uh, it's easier for me to do the podcast this way. Now, on the other shows that you did, you had to. Yes, and right. the other show, I mean, I, was, uh, I did a show out of Connecticut, which is how I met you. You right. guessed twice on the show. And I was, uh, as a producer of that show, we did have sponsors, and I had to go out to get uh, some advertisers to work with us. 
was was did you find that at all difficult? Yes and no. Um, yes, because a lot of people weren't quite comfortable with the content of the show because it was a sort of a Howard Stern type of raunchy comedy program. But no, because I was able to put together a media kit to explain why they should advertise with us, who our audience is, and why our listeners would be the perfect consumers for the products that were being advertised. Once again, I think you just gave me a key to success. Mm -hmm. You're hitting home runs here today, boy. And not at City Field either. Correct. Or a hole in one. Mm -hmm. um, as I scratch crud out of my eye, which I'm sure the audience is now just like, ew. Yeah. But it happens. So you do also write. Yes. W what, if there was a topic out there, w and there's a hundred different topics all over the place, what is it that comes across your, your mind, your desk, your, your brain, where you say, there's enough meat on that bone that that's something I want to write about? I actually don't look at it uh, in that uh, carnivorous sense. I like to go after a subject that other people really aren't writing about. Uh, as a film critic, uh, my specialty was uh, classic and obscure films, and I was able to go after that because a lot of film writers are going after the contemporary stuff, so I could set myself apart from, from those people. Uh, one of the articles I did recently, which I really enjoyed, and it was, uh, again, I hope your viewers don't turn me off while I'm spatting this out, it was about uh, hermit crabs. In, along the Connecticut shoreline, and apparently, because there had been so much development along the shoreline, uh, the species was starting to disappear. And there was a professor at Sacred Heart University who came up with a solution on how to preserve the shoreline and to save the hermit crabs. And to me, this was, uh, I thought it was a fascinating story because nobody else was covering it. Wow. I actually got a lot of good feedback from the story, too. How's it going over there? Well, the hermit crabs are coming back. Uh, fortunately, uh, I don't know if they have uh, Viagra for the hermit crabs, but uh, they're, they're multiplying, and uh, they're making a comeback in Connecticut. Now, and I'm not normally the type that bounces around, and it just seems to work out this way. Gun to your head, if, if you had to choose. Mm -hmm. Major cinema blockbuster... $400 million budget mm -hmm. or $250 silent black and white. Mm -hmm. Is there a better one that you would go with? No, I'd go with both if it's done correctly. That's the whole point. It isn't so much how much money you're spending, it's how you're using the money. Uh, my favorite big blockbuster is the 1968 uh, Russian version of War and Peace, which ran about eight hours and won the, the Oscar for Best Foreign Film. And to me, it's the most invigorating uh, eight hours imaginable. But I also like uh, little uh, puny black and white films like the, the notorious stinker Bela Lugosi meets a Brooklyn Gorilla. That's actually uh, it's a joke of some friends of mine because I'm one of the few people who actively love the film, but I do. And I think that movie was probably made on a, a $10 budget. But uh, again, it isn't so much how much money you're using, it's just what kind of a script you have and what kind of talent you have on both sides of the camera. Now, speaking of scripts, great segue is, that's what we call in the business, segue. Um, when scripts come to your desk... Yes, because I'm also an actor. Right. And I've done about 25 films. How is it where you pick a script? Or is it just whatever you throw at me, I'm taking? Uh... Well, I don't do that much acting because uh, I'm not a full-time actor. I, I do that more for my amusement than my uh, career. But if something's thrown at me, uh, normally I would just take it and say, okay, this would be good. Sometimes I've had scripts sent to me, and I've actually asked if I could make changes to it. There was one script that was sent to me. It was a comedy film called London Betty. And my character was supposed to be a, uh, a Russian hitman. And I was reading it, and I realized my character didn't have any funny lines. Everybody else in the movie had funny lines. And also... I couldn't do a good Russian accent. So I went to the director and I had said, would it be okay instead of doing a Russian hitman if I was a transvestite ex-marine hitman? And nice. he said, okay. And I actually wrote up the, the, how that dialogue would be and that character in that dialogue wound up in the film. 
That's good to find a director willing to bend over like that. A lot of independent film directors will be uh, willing to do that. If I try to do that with uh, Spielberg or Scorsese, I don't think <laughs> that's going to work. Now, do you, th do you think, in your wildest dreams, mm -hmm. that the true classic-type mm -hmm. film will ever return? It's possible, because uh, who knows? Come back in 25 or 30 years, whatever might be in the, in the cinema today could uh, be considered uh, the classic of tomorrow. I mean, there were films that were made back in the 70s or 80s that were very poorly considered, and uh, today people have taken a second look at them and said, oh, these were these are really quite good. So uh, classics don't, uh, very few classics are instant classics, so, so like Jaws or Star Wars. Those are few and far between. A lot of classics, they, it takes time to grow before you're able to uh, fully appreciate what was created. Well, the one I was thinking of was uh, Warriors. Mm -hmm. Instant, mm. I'm not instant cult classic, but through the years it's just grown, or The Last Dragon, for example. Yeah. Barry Gordy had no idea what he had sitting on yeah. him. And for it to explode the way it has through the years... Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if, if something like that could ever happen. It could happen. In fact, it's funny because uh, prior to us going on the air, we were having a discussion with one of your cameramen, and uh, he had asked if about the Billy Wilder film, Kiss Me Stupid, which was made in 1964. When that came out, that film was a huge flop. Today, uh, it's considered to be a classic. So what a difference 53 years makes. I don't have 53 years. I don't think I have three years. Mm -hmm. Maybe two, the last one and a half in trouble. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Can I have your time slot if you go? You could have my time slot. You could have this wonderful crew that I have to fight with every single day. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know I'm yeah. number one. Thank you. Yeah. We're getting some hand signals from the booth behind the camera. See, you know, they're just angry because they're Eagle fans and they're so pent up and angry and they're, they they're, have they're backed eagle, up stuff. They're Eagle fans. Yes. They're the ones. Okay. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for coming all the way here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I, I really appreciate yeah. it. Yes, 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 I know. Yeah. But hey, it's a Cyclone Variety show. Why would I miss this? No one in their right mind would miss a show like this. Mm, is it? Well, no, I guess you're right. Because some, right. <laughs> some people aren't in their right minds, though. That's right. See, that in the business what we call an inside joke. Anyways. Y'all want to hear some more music? Definitely. Our friend Grant's going to come back? Absolutely. He's got a nice here hat, too, actually. Grant's the net. Take two. It was a long time ago I would sit by your side It was the endless flow Of the ebbing tide Don't I know That the ocean's wide Baby, please don't go To the other side Ocean's emptiness As I watch you sail into the west I know I'll be forever less Without the hope of your caress So the old dreams fade away Cause we took too long to say In the end it's so I love you
Jesus. Feel the ocean's emptiness. Ooh, oh, oh. Feel the ocean's emptiness. Ooh, oh, oh. Feel the ocean's emptiness. Ooh, oh, oh. Feel the ocean's emptiness. Without the hope of your caress So the old dreams fade away Cause it took too long to say In the end it's okay Cause I love you Thank you very, very much for stopping by. So, I got to ask you right off the top. Being that you're newer to New York and the New York music scene, how do you rate it compared to other cities' music scenes? Well, I'm from, you know, I, I came, we, my wife and I moved here about uh, 45 days ago, and we moved from a log cabin out in the woods of New Hampshire, about an hour from the nearest Walmart, literally. So New York is, is like a major, you know, step up as far as I just found out the other day that the, um, you know, the head of the marketing department of Atlantic Records, which is Ed Sheeran's record company, lives two floors below me in my apartment building. So, yeah. So, really? Um, yeah. So living here in New York, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna, you know, <laughs> to put me closer to some of these connections because now I can go down two floors and there's somebody huge rather than drive an hour to the nearest Walmart. I think I'm going to have to stalk him to maybe <laughs> drop, you know, a couple of headshots and resumes. You know, <laughs> I definitely need to get the address to. Sneak I'll, I'll let you know where I live, and then you can just take what I said to and kind of look around and stalk him. <laughs> you know, it's not below me, by the way, to slide a headshot and resume underneath an, a door. I've done it before. I don't know which which door is theirs, but I know what floor they're on, so you can slide under every door. In it. I'll do it. I'll do. I'll do <laughs> it too. I, mean, I should do that. Hmm. I think we should all do it. So, let me ask you. Musically, what's been the best advice anybody's ever given you? Hmm. Probably the best, the best advice is maybe the most general at the same time. Is, uh, don't give up. Don't quit. You know, even when it, when it seems like it's not working, when it's the hardest. Um, somebody once told me not too long ago that the music business is a war of attrition, meaning the one who lasts the longest wins. So, I'm going to stick around for a while. Now, what's next for you musically? I mean, okay, you perform here. I'll say around the world, because it, it's pretty much... It, if you check out GrantsDonette.com, which should be underneath right about now, if you go there... You'll see how good he really... See, I can't say what I want to say because they'll throw me out. But I can say he's really that effing good. That I can say. Right in the control room, I could get away with effing? I, I can just go... No? Whenever you do that, if you want. That, that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> so, what is next? W w in your mind's eye, what do you want to do next? Right, so... As a singer and a guitar player, I've only been doing this, singing and playing guitar, for about a year and a half now. And the last, like, the first year I did it was just literally trying to learn how to play the instruments. Because before that, I was I played another instrument, and I didn't it wasn't this at all. Um, so now I'm just trying to get out in front of people as much as humanly possible, and hopefully, maybe um, you know, find some people that really like what I do. The I guess the the overall goal is to to get to build a following and maybe make you know, make some connections with people that would be interested in helping me out. I don't know. I don't know if those kind of people exist. But, uh, you know, like say, here, introduce to this person and sign you to this record company or something, whatever. I don't really know. 
a lot of this I'm just flying blind. I'm trying, but you know, I don't know what I'm. I guess everybody says nobody knows what this what you're supposed to do in this business. But um, right now I'm just trying to book as many shows as as humanly possible. Just trying to play as much as possible. Uh, this this October and November I'll be recording uh, a new CD to be released in January. Um, so that's probably the next the very next step. And I've got a whole bunch of shows that I've booked in between the recording sessions. Now look. I'm just curious, between singing and songwriting, is there one that you actually like more than the other? Honestly, no, because for me, singing and songwriting come hand in hand. Uh, because I mentioned I was a diff I was I played a different instrument before. I had never sung until about a year and a half ago now. Um, so when I started singing, I knew that what I wanted to do was I wanted to play the music that I feel in my heart and that I write. So I never really spent much time learning covers. I did a couple of those types of things just to, to gain a style. But, um, but the writing music and singing, at writing lyrics and singing, to me, is kind of, they're two parts of the same thing. I can't really do one without the other. I, I don't know that I'll ever sing somebody else's song as well as I'll be able to sing my own. And I don't know that I, I don't know that, you know, it, my words would be right coming from somebody else. Maybe they would, but. Is there something that gives you that extra oomph of inspiration to write about? Yeah, um, you know, often it's it's real life experiences. Um, it's either the love I feel for someone, um, or the the pain that I've. Mm -hmm. like, yes, the love I feel for you. I'll write a song for you next. Um, or the pain I feel from an experience where someone hurt me. It's often those kind of personal relationships, and you know what happened between me and someone else that I, that I, I really get like, yes, this would be worth actually spending the time of my life to put into, to words, you know. So you love me and my crew hurt you because of their laziness. No, your crew's awesome, man. These guys are cool. All right. I'll, I'll let you guys slide today only because he says so. And the guest is always right. Yeah, watching, yeah. watching you. Just don't make me like purple, okay? When you, okay. Lord knows what he's going to make. He's <laughs> going to try to make me look fatter. But I want to thank you. Thank you. And, you. and you'll sing us out afterwards? Oh, definitely, yeah. Cool. Thanks a lot. Now, you guys really want to laugh? This is where you go, yes. Because this guy is going to make you laugh. I think he will. I don't know how much longer he's going to want to actually be known as one of my friends. But anyways, for the second time on this show, because he was on the very, very, very first episode 18,000 years ago, it took me that long to come up with only 23 episodes. Long story that I don't want to get into because it's going to make me go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Anyways, enough of me talking and more of him. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Paul. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Wow, I have great introduction. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Wow. That was great, man. Um, yeah, thanks for having me back again. It was pretty cool. Um, just, this audience is amazing. Um, how many people out here actually have kids? Do you have any parents out here? Do you have a couple of parents? Okay. Uh, I'm a parent. I have two kids. I have a 14-year-old going on 15. I got a three-year-old going on Ridlin. Um, <laughs> Can't stand, can't stand my 15-year-old, okay? Really? Um, here's the reason why. Um, as a comic, I travel all the time. I was just recently in Altoona, Pennsylvania. I'm not bragging, okay? So we're in Altoona, and my 15-year-old gives He's like, hey, Dad, the dog just took a crap in the living room. Should I clean it up? Like, no, no, don't clean it up. Let it stay there. <laughs> let it get hard. Let it turn white. Okay? When I get home, we'll paint it, and we'll tell your mother, we just got a brand new end table. He goes, really? Okay, this is why you have to hate cleaning, right? Like, I don't know if anyone has, like, a, a, a teenager, a 15-year-old, but the like, 15-year-olds love to, like, misuse words. Like, my kid used, loves to use the word gay. Everything is gay, right? Like, the other day, I was wearing a tie. He's like, hey, Dad, that tie is gay. I didn't know ties had sexual orientation connected with them. 
Okay, I didn't know that. But like this like random shit is gay, like random stuff is gay. Okay, like I was drinking like a can of soda. I drank half the can of soda, I put it down, he goes, hey, that, that's gay. What's a straight amount of soda? Okay, I don't know what a straight amount of soda is. We live in New York, and we were hanging out in uh, Times Square. And he sees this guy on a city bike. And the guy's wearing shorts, and he's got a fanny pack on, and he's got one of those crash helmets. And he goes, hey, Dad, that guy's gay. I go, you know what? You finally nailed it. That's right, you got it. I have held two of the most dangerous jobs a person could have. Um, I was a New York City cop. Uh, dangerous job. Uh, I got stabbed on the job. I stopped doing it because I didn't like the feeling of getting stabbed on the job. Okay? <laughs> Second job I had, much more dangerous, 100 times more dangerous. Became a New York City high school teacher, where I tried to avoid getting stabbed every day. Okay? Um, just like, guess, take a look at me. What do you think I taught? What would you have to guess that I taught? And if you say Jim, I will kill you. Okay? It wasn't, wasn't Jim, okay? it wasn't history. I taught English. But it wasn't just English, it was British literature. Do you hear the way I speak? Okay, this was like having Rambo teaching your kid Macbeth. Fair is foul, foul is fair. I had no idea what they were talking about. Okay, I thought, I thought Shakespeare had a baseball thing. I had no idea, okay? But it was a, it was a pretty cool uh, job. I enjoyed it. When you teach British literature, you just don't only teach the, uh, the literature part. You also have to teach the grammar. And this was kind of like an inner city school. So I would have to go around the room every day and just like see what people knew. I'd ask one day, hey, anybody know what a period is? Where would you use a comma? One day I go, hey, anybody know what an apostrophe is? And this kid lying on the back pops up. He goes, yeah, I know what apostrophe is. Apostrophe is them dudes that hang out with Jesus, right? <laughs> I was like, no, not at all. I was like, these kids thought that Beowulf was a real wolf, okay? And if you don't get that joke, my jokes require you to do a little bit of homework, so you got to check, check that out. But it was, it was a cool school. I enjoyed working there. Uh, nice place, but ugly staff. Really, some of the ugliest people I've ever seen in my life. Like, for instance, like the uh, principal had one of those big, bushy, like 1980s Tom Selleck mustaches, you know? Yeah, I'll always remember Mrs. Baker. <laughs> she looked like Magnum P.I. in a sundress. Cool place. Um, like I said... Liked it, lo loved, loved teaching, um, but you know, I, I guess you, know, you could turn into your real passion. My real passion became comedy, loved doing comedy, loved, loved doing it. Financially, I'm set for the rest of my life. Provided I die within the next two days, I'm good to go. Okay? Uh, when, you, when you do comedy, you get to travel a lot. I was just recently in Cleveland, Ohio. Anybody? Cleveland. Yeah, okay, okay. Everybody else makes good life choices. Beautiful, okay? So I'm in Cleveland, uh, a woman comes up to me after a show, she's like, hey Jeff, I thought you were really funny, you remind me of another comic that I like. I was like, thank you. I go, who's the other comic? She goes, I don't remember his name, but he has Down syndrome. <laughs> yeah, that's a messed up thing to say to somebody. That is a messed up thing to say to somebody. But then she continues the conversation, she goes, um, I heard in your introduction that they said you were from New York. What part of New York are you from? So I told her, I go, I'm from Staten Island. She goes, ooh, sorry. Like I just told her it was a pedophile, right? So then she goes, but did I hear you right? Did I hear you say that you're from Staten Island? I was like, yeah, that's right. I'm from Staten Island. She goes, my nephew Bruce, he lives on Long Island. And I was like, I'm, I'm confused now. Are we just naming islands in New York? Because I have a buddy, Pete. He's over in Rikers Island, so I, I, I don't know what you want to do with this. This is one's on you. This was the best part of the whole conversation, okay? She goes to me, hey, what's it like to be in show business? All right, first of all, I'm a comic. I am not in show business, okay? I am doing the Cyclone Variety Hour, okay? So I am hey. definitely, yeah, so I am not in show business. Cyclone, I am in show business like the way the New York Jets are in the NFL, okay? Like I am in the league, but nobody cares. <laughs> Like I said, when you're in Cleveland, not a lot to do. Um, okay, <laughs> someone says, hey, now, I don't know what that means, but that, that's, a, that's a good thing to add. I know, but when you're in Cleveland, there's not a lot to do. So uh, the only thing to do really was to go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, 
I don't know if you guys have ever been there, but in the gift shop of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, they had a hoodie and the Blowfish tour jacket. <laughs> there is a hoodie and the Blowfish tour jacket in the gift shop of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I mean, it's in the Lost and Found, but it is in there. Hey, guys, I'm Jeffrey Paul. Thank you so much. So, thank you once again for coming by. <laughs> All right, should I just like, talk like this? Yes, oh, I did. Yeah. All right, hello, everybody. We, we have to speak to, into the microphones. Okay. That's, that's should I look at you? I don't know what to do. I, I mean, uh, if you don't want to, you I don't have to. You. You're a very handsome guy. Thank you. Hey, you got the good goatee. You're all trimmed up for today. You're excited. I can see. Oh, yeah, I'm really excited. Yeah. So, do you pr- uh, like I just, it? I just want to see something. This is just like a test run, or is this the show? This is the show. And that's what you're going to wear? Wow. I, 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 you I, know what? It's, a, it's enough that the crew beats <laughs> me up. I love the crew. I love the crew. It's just a the, beat down one, on me. One of the cameramen is a comic. Come on. This is a great crew. It is, it is just a beat down on me today, isn't it? We love it. Go ahead. Yeah. So do you honestly like going on the road more than... Yeah, I love it. Yeah. They're both entirely different things. I love going on the road. Um, one, because you get more money. Uh, uh, but, but two, yeah, d- different audiences, but nothing beats the energy, the vibe of work in New York City. Um, nothing beats the, the, you know, the feeling like when you're getting off a train or you're walking down um, West Third Street and then you make that turn onto McDougal and you see all the lights and the energy and the people and you get to realize, man, I'm really privileged here. I'm going to be able to perform in one of these clubs. That's great. Nothing beats that. Nothing on the road could beat that. Is there any topics that you won't hit on? No. Nope. Nothing's off limits. Nothing offends me. Um, I, you know, just like uh, when uh, Phil was talking about movies, as long as it's done well and it's funny, I am, I'm on board with everything. Now, being that the climate is so PC, and a lot of comics have taken hits yeah. for, for going, you yeah. know... One way or another. Sure. Do you find it tougher for yourself? Um, no, I think as, as comics, I mean, one of the things that we're, we're trained to do is like we learn how to read the room. You know, like, yeah, the room, you know, the energy was off the charts here. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> no, but you, when you go into a place, like, you know, I, I've done colleges, I've done, I've done you know, um, I've done 55 in older communities. I mean, I've, I've worked the gamut. And, you know, you just like, you just know, like, what joke to kind of do, what kind of crowd work, work to do. Um, certain, certain, you know, places, you know, got to be, you know, squeaky clean, and sometimes, you know, it's as filthy as, as you can be. You know, the time of the day of the show makes a difference. So not only are you a stand-up, right. but you are also the co-host of ah, the... S- listen, as a fellow BWRN show, me and myself, mm-hmm. I plug away... I plug more than Gene Simmons, which is pretty hard to do. True. But uh, how did the idea of the well, let's tell sp- people what go ahead, sports me. book podcast. See, I knew you're gonna mess it up. Sports, sports book box office podcast. podcast. But I get it. You know what? I get it right on the plugs on the show. You That's too, man. We really appreciate that. So, how did that idea come up? Okay, I, it's a it's a podcast uh, that I host with uh, Kevin Goatee. Uh, he's also a New York City comedian. And we got the idea is we'll be like it, at a place like the Grizzly Pear. That's like a, a kind of like a dive bar in New York City that, that does music and uh, comedy, mostly comedy. And um, we will always be talking about and arguing sports and, 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 and movies. And we're like, and people would like just like, like listen and just kind of be like interested in what, you know, our conversation. And we thought like, you know, this is something that we could like uh, actually like, sell to people and, and and let people like, kind of like get in, in on. So we decided, you know, over a year ago, we were on our second season doing this box office, sports book box office. <laughs> See, it's if not, you, if, you, yeah, if you don't get the name no, right. Roll, rolls off your tongue. <laughs> rolls off your tongue. Kevin thought of the name, didn't he? He did. You know I did. I just wanted this to be something simple. Jeff and Kevin talk sports and movies. I thought that would be good. But, but Kevin was like, oh, we, we, need, we need to, you know, he came up with a great graphic idea, though. You know, I don't know if, you know, if you've ever seen our graphic, but it's tremendous. That's what I can brag about. Now, just out of curiosity, do you think anytime soon there will be a New York sports champion? Ooh, man. Okay, let's go, let's go down the list. 
Um, baseball would probably be the closest. I'm going to think the Yankees. I think the Yankees are probably uh, – I could see, with the right acquisitions next year, I can see them win the World Series next year. That young nucleus is great. Um, I love the infield. I'm just thinking about this today on the way over here, how D.D. DeGlorious has made people basically forget about Gita. It was a seamless transition, okay? Um, the kid Judge seems to be, like, legit. He's, he's, he's not what he was in April, but he also wasn't a slumping guy right after the uh, All-Star break. Um, the Mets, I think, have some major issues. Uh, I think it starts with ownership. Um, and, no, I, I don't see them winning. Um, football, listen, I'm a Jeff fan. I'll never see a Super Bowl in my lifetime. I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very okay with that. Giants are off to a very disappointing start. But, you know, good organization usually. Um, I don't know about the hockey locals and knowing basketball. So I'd say our best shot at a New York champion, Yankees. And on that note, I want to say you're a champion. And I thank you. Are you sincere you. when you say that? Yes, I'm okay. very, I'm so sincere. I don't, know. I don't know if I believe you. Are we going to go back to Grant soon? Yes, in a few minutes. Grant was a very funny, uh, he was a very, he was a very talented guy, wasn't he? Yes. It? Yeah, I like the song. So is Phil, so are you. Thanks. Everyone's talented here. Yeah, you put on a good show, you really do. And thanks for having me. You're welcome. Nobody ever gives me credit. What? How is it, after all these years, nobody has given me the credit I deserve? The people here in management refuse to acknowledge my greatness. I'm a god among men. I see those fingers again, by the way. Y'all are getting demerits in there. But until next month, I want to say I thank my crew that actually did show up today. I want to thank you guys for showing up today. Oh, my God. Thank you. I want to thank my guests for showing up. And until next month. By the way, guys, CycloneComedy.com, BoneheadPicks.com. Check out all my MMA articles. You can also check me out on Facebook, In the Cage with Cyclone, and also the Cyclone Variety Show. Like both pages. I know it's a lot you got to do. Got to go to two pages on Facebook, click like. Real hard. Really, really hard. Just do it. And do it now. So, until next month, I am Cyclone saying, stay humble, America.